COD 2019 dropped in October and has since been the subject of a lot of debate. A reboot of the popular Modern Warfare series bringing back old characters seemed promising. However, the game has its fair share of complaints. While not as divisive as the advanced movement games in the series, the divide in the player base cannot be ignored. Opinions aside, what is keeping Modern Warfare from being a perfect game? First off, perfection, especially in a video game, is 100% subjective. Not everybody will agree on any given subject. But in this analysis, we will be dissecting each facet of the game. From campaign to multiplayer, as well as looking deeper into the core gameplay. Each section of this analysis will take a look at the game from both an objective and subjective view. This will be a long one, so timestamps for each section will appear on the screen and down in the description and comments. So without further delay, let's begin with the campaign. I think it goes without saying, but there will be spoilers ahead for the whole campaign. Consisting of just 14 missions, the campaign on a regular playthrough with a competent player will take maybe 6 hours. It's pretty short, but it packed a punch in those few hours. The campaign begins with a cutscene which shows you the two main antagonists, the wolf and the butcher, in a video that's playing on a tablet. Both of these persons are part of Al-Qatala, a terrorist organization in the game. The camera pans off of the tablet and onto the other persons that are riding in the back of a van. Right before the van stops, you see a person with a bomb vest on. The van stops and the person with the vest emerges. People walking by slowly start to take notice and right before the vest is going to be detonated, there's a cut to black, with only the words modern warfare on the screen in silence. These first few seconds show that this story is gritty and intense. Right after that, you begin the first mission. Taking place 24 hours earlier, you take control of Alex, a CIA agent with a mission to recover the gas shipments in a Russian compound that's headed by General Barkov, another one of the game's main antagonists. After you get a positive ID on this gas, your group is ambushed and the gas is stolen. Kate Laswell calls up Captain Price for help recovering the stolen gas in an attempt to de-escalate this situation with Russia. Next, you take control of Sergeant Garrick in Piccadilly, bringing you back up to speed with this starting cutscene. You're traveling in a car because your team did have some intel on this, and soon enough, the explosions happen and a fight breaks out. You fight these terrorists through the streets, all while checking your fire as there are civilians nearby. After clearing out the first wave, you head into a building in which you're saved by Captain Price. Next, you enter the building and attempt to save some hostages. One of the hostages there has a bomb vest on, and it's welded shut. The next moment is one that I never expected. Usually you're the super soldier, capable of doing it all. But in this instance, you aren't able to just defuse this bomb or take off the vest in time. Price makes the only reasonable choice, which is to push the civilian over the railing when the bomb's about to detonate. This saved you and some other civilians. And only two missions into this game, and it's really showing you the brutality of war. Terrorists are killing people, including children in these streets, and an innocent man is thrown over a railing just to save some others. What Price did made sense, but it's still a moment I didn't expect. It really solidified the tone of this game. War. It's not fun. It's not pretty. It's gritty, and innocent people are killed. After this mission, you take control again of Alex, now in Urzikstan, speaking to Commander Farah Karim, who's a leader of a local resistance group. In this mission, you are shown as more innocent people are killed because the Russians believe that they are the ones that stole the gas. In these next two missions, you play as Alex helping Farah with attempting to find this gas shipment and attack one of Barkov's air bases. Destroying the air base buys time, as now Russian air travel is severely limited but Barkov will retaliate. The next mission shifts tones dramatically, going from a guns a-blazing with Alex to a tactical room-by-room -room breach and clear in a townhouse searching for the wolves' whereabouts. Before we get into the meat of this mission, I think now's a good time to mention how good this game looks and sounds. 
I don't know if this video will do it justice, but playing on my monitor on realism really had me immersed. With realism, you're basically playing on the veteran difficulty, but with a very limited HUD. And with the use of night vision goggles, and it's imperative to use them in this game, you can't really see anything lurking in the dark, if you're using normal brightness settings, that is. And as is normal with usually every new Call of Duty release, the game looks better and better. You can see the scratches on your guns, the details on the uniforms of other operators, and so many other small things that many might just overlook. When you're in the house, you can clearly hear which direction people are yelling from, where these footsteps are, and you can hear just about everything with the right set of headphones. The guns sound like they pack a punch, and I just think they did a phenomenal job with the look and sound of it all, kind of really bringing it back into what this real thing would sound like. Back in the original Modern Warfare, night vision goggles were there, but were honestly never really needed in full. This game seems to really make you use them if you want to progress. If you don't, you just can't see. The sound and green filter when you put the goggles on just makes the situation feel more real when you're having to go room to room taking out targets. This mission proves that Call of Duty can have phenomenal design when it's used correctly. You're looking for the wolf, going from room to room slowly and using your judgment to decide who lives and who dies. Obviously, there's going to be bad guys with guns, but there's women, and even a child that if you deem necessary, you can kill. The game leaves it up to you. When you're going room to room, you don't really know what to expect. Is this seemingly helpless woman going to grab a gun, or is she a victim of circumstance who truly has no ties to these terrorists? One woman is acting like she's being held hostage, but as soon as you kill her captor, she goes for a gun. But will every situation be like this? Will you kill everyone regardless if they go for a gun or not? It's your call. I fucking love this mission. The pure tension and slow pacing really makes it feel real. I played through the campaign a total of three times. The first playthrough on Hardened, as I'm really used to how COD plays, one on Recruit for the ease of getting certain cutscenes and uh, gameplay pieces to record, but the game really shined on realism. As I said earlier, realism is just veteran with a very limited HUD, giving missions like Clean House a real feel. You don't know how much ammo you actually have or what equipment you have. You die quickly, which can be pretty problematic on missions that just throw enemies at you like No Tomorrow. But in these dark tactical missions, your actions have some weight. You can die in a matter of a couple shots, so your reaction time is of utmost importance. I think the game really needs to be played on realism in order to have the most immersive experience possible. However, realism can be a bit frustrating at times. Sometimes you just have a really bad checkpoint and you're just getting shot immediately after reloading a save. And I've had to just keep replaying a checkpoint more than I'd like to even admit just to progress. Even though I'd say I'm a good player, this setting does have its frustrating moments. After clearing the house, you take back control of Alex. The intel from the house gives you a positive location on the wolf. You infiltrate a hospital to find the wolf's location. This throws you right back into the guns a blazing area of the game. Sometimes I just wish the game had more stealth missions, but I can see how some people would think it would be a bit much considering Call of Duty is really known for just being an over-the-top action shooter. However, I do like the change of pace from shooting everything to calming down and taking your time to tactically clear some areas. After clearing the hospital, you capture the wolf and move him into the U.S. Embassy. In the Embassy, the wolf's right-hand man, known as the Butcher, launches an attack on the building. During the mission, you see the Butcher demand you to hand over the wolf, killing innocent people and children in an attempt to get you to hand him over. Ultimately, the wolf is freed. You go back to Urzikstan with Farah and Hadir, and you embark on a mission to kill some of the wolves on what is known as the Highway of Death. This mission starts with you using a sniper modified by Hadir. It is literally the only time in the campaign where sniping is something that takes a little bit of consideration. This distance and the wind are both things that you need to take into account when you're shooting. During the mission, some of Barkov's men attack both Farah's militia and the Alcatala forces. While becoming overrun, Hadir decides now is the right time to use some explosives on the enemies, to even out the playing field. 
This is when it's revealed that Hadir is the one who stole the Russian gas in the first mission. For some reason, Hadir is the only one who had a gas mask on him, so he pretty much sets off the gas and puts you and Farah at risk of death. You fall back to a bunker where Hadir gets a mask on both you and Farah. He explains to you that this needed to be done, and that you need to explain to Farah what his reasonings are when you both wake up. Hadir then flees, knowing that Farah will most likely not forgive him for his actions. Next, a flashback ensues, showing the long-standing history between Barkov and Hadir and Farah. Flashing back to 1999, you play as a young Farah during Barkov's initial invasion. You start the mission, noticing that you're under some rubble and that your mother is dead. After being freed from the rubble, you are reunited back with your father, who goes back to the house to grab Hadir. Your father is then killed. When your father is killed, you and Hadir basically need to sneak up on this Russian soldier and overpower and kill him. While it's a fun game of cat and mouse, it really was not too believable for me. You find some scissors and a screwdriver in which you stab him with, and his reaction to getting stabbed is to hit you and then give you a moment to run off basically. I mean, yeah, obviously you and Hadir needed to escape, but I find it hard to believe that this Russian soldier, which like the others is shown to have no remorse when killing, wouldn't just shoot you after hitting you. I mean, he had the energy to hit you after you stabbed him, but not to pull the trigger? Given I haven't been stabbed, but I, I do find it hard to believe that two children can overpower a dude with a fully automatic weapon. Maybe I'm looking too deep into it, but it bothered me a little bit. You and Hadir escape after killing the man, running through the streets seeing men, women, children, and animals being killed by the gas. It shows really how ruthless Barkov's men are. Killing kids is bad and all, but when I saw that poor dog dying, oh, I knew Barkov needed to die. You end up in a small area where you need to kill two Russian guards to steal a truck. You find a revolver, because they were talking about that, of why are you using a semi-auto, and you kill them both. You use a cell phone to call Hadir, who is on the outside of this map, moving along the perimeter to distract these guards. The gun is big and bulky, and you're a child, so the gun handles very poorly. Which, when I first saw the gun being a magnum, I verbally said, Bullshit, when I had to pick it up. Luckily, once you pick it up, you do struggle to keep the weapon wrong, and the slights constantly move because, well, you are a child. You kill the guys and get into the truck, but not before Barkov captures you two. And I'm glad we didn't just drive off, because I would have been very annoyed if two children just figured out how to drive a big-ass truck with no problems. This mission gave some good backstory into the uh, history of Farah, Hadir, and Barkov, and overall I understood the purpose. But with the soldier in the house and the magnum, I wasn't really immersed. Barkov then takes you to and imprisons you for the next 10 years. While in prison, Farah becomes Commander Kareem of the Rebel Forces. Barkov interrogates you by waterboarding you, but encourages you to live? Like, he wants to know who Commander Kareem is, even though he already knows, and he also wants to know where a key that Hadir stole is. You have some dialogue options in this matter, but it doesn't really matter. I, I doubt it impacts anything. Some explosions happen, and Barkov goes away, giving you a chance to escape. You find a rock, throw it at a button to release the cells. Why is the button to release the cells just, like, right in the middle of this hallway? It's beyond me. I think the contractor for this prison definitely needs to be fired. You free yourself and the other prisoners and break out of camp. There's a sniper trying to kill you, so you need to use cover more often than you would, but it isn't really a huge deal. At the end of the mission, you are helped by a beardless Captain Price. Well, he's not a captain yet, and he's definitely younger, as shown by the lack of the beard. It is so weird seeing Price without a beard. It's like almost nightmare feel. I don't like it. Well, back to the present day, Hadir has seemingly defected to the Alcatala forces. In an attempt to locate him and the wolf, you clear a house, fall into a hole, and then find and kill the wolf. Hadir is nowhere to be seen. The US government declares the militia, leaded by Farah, as a terrorist organization. Alex doesn't agree with this and goes back to Urzikstan to help Farah. Back in control of Garrick, you and Price meet up with Nikolai in order to capture the Butcher. You interrogate him, but he doesn't speak. Price tells you to grab the packages from outside. And when Price said this, I pretty much knew exactly that it was going to be this man's family. 
You grab his wife and son from the back of a van, and you bring them in. Price gives you a magnum and asks if you're in. You have the option to follow through or back out, and honestly, I've never clicked the back out option, so I don't even know what happens. After some more interrogation, you shoot the gun, and it's unloaded. The butcher's kind of freaking out, same with his family, and Price places some shells down and tells you to load the gun. The butcher gives you the info that you came for, and you're left to decide if he should live or die. I shot him. Seeing how ruthless he was at the embassy made me feel like death was the only suitable option for this man. I loved this part of the mission. It shows how dirty war really is. Using a man's family who is seemingly innocent as leverage to get what you want, it's hard to take in, but it's the world we live in. Price says it best. We get dirty, the world stays clean. We do fucked up things to keep order in this world that the public doesn't even know about. It's a really powerful statement, showing what public often doesn't know about war. You learn from the butcher where Hadir is, and what his plans are. He's planning an attack on Barkov and his men. Price and Garrick move in to intercept Hadir in what is possibly one of the best missions in the whole Call of Duty franchise. Going dark. I sing praise about Clean House, so get ready for my boner for this mission. You start off making your way to the estate in the darkness. In this mission, night vision goggles are again a necessity. After a brief linear segment, Price tells you to search some areas to find Hadir. There are three main areas to check. The clock tower, church, and pool. You're given free reign over which order you choose to enter these areas. Which is a little different from the linear sections of what is normally a Call of Duty campaign. When exploring these areas, you can find some electrical boxes on the buildings to shut off power and keep enemies in the dark. Utilizing the darkness to take out enemies before they even know you're there. There's groups patrolling the grounds that you'll need to avoid getting seen by, and getting seen will set off an alarm, and then all bets are off, and it's guns blazing. Price pretty much just stays on the ledge for this whole section, shooting out some light fixtures along the way to keep you in the dark. But besides that, you're on your own. You search the three buildings and find hostages, but no positive ID on Hadir. You attempt to get information out of the hostages, but all but one of them are out of it. And of course, the game wasn't just going to let you find Hadir in one of these buildings first try. Instead, he's basically in the center mansion, which, yes, you have to check out. You and Price find him, and Hadir reveals that he has the location of the gas factory Barkov uses, and he's planning on attacking him to end this conflict. You take Hadir and narrowly escape a helicopter that's chasing you. All before your exfil shows up, though, Laswell enters the equation. Hadir is taken into custody by Laswell and given to the Russians as a bargaining chip. In exchange for this, Price decides to keep the intel. After learning of the location of the factory, you take control of Alex again as you fight your way up to the base. You have air support which you can use to take out groups of enemies in this mission as there is a lot that they throw at you. After making your way into the factory, you fight some more goons and meet up with Nikolai. He gives you the detonator, as the plans are to plant bombs and destroy the facility. You gotta fight a juggernaut, and then it's revealed that the detonator's busted from that fight. Ferris says she'll go in and plant the bomb and manually detonate it, but then Alex insists he goes, telling Farrah to give the orders. Alex enters with the explosives, and that's the last time you see him. I really liked Alex as a character. Like I said, the campaign's pretty short, but he got developed a pretty decent amount. And, well... I guess he died for a good cause. Now you take back control of Garrick as you make your way into the compound and attempt to locate where Barkov is. Farrah is suddenly missing, and then you take control of her as she managed to get inside of the helicopter that Barkov is attempting to escape on. You snake up on him and stab him a bunch as he spews some nonsense. Then you have a dialogue option, which probably impacts nothing, and then you push him off the helicopter. After he falls, you go to the front where it's seen that Nikolai is piloting this aircraft, and with that, the bombs are detonated, and the mission is complete. The final mission of Modern Warfare. Literally ending in a bang. But wait, there's more. A cutscene shows. Price and Laswell are meeting up at a cafe to basically discuss the future. In what is the most fanservice-y scene in a game that I have ever witnessed. Yeah, well, I'm a long way from a proper pint. 
Russia disowned Barkov. Oh, I didn't have much choice, did I? He's dead. You took a big bite out of that problem, John. For now. We're left unchecked. It won't be. General Shepard pulled the files you asked for. What exactly is this about? A task force. Mm -mm. We already have loose ends. Then I will tie them. I can fund assets, not outlaws. Enjoy the tea, then. Sakaya wants Barkov's throne. I almost buried him in Pripyat with Macmillan. That was the father. This is the son, Victor. Lovely family. They're big fans of Hadir's. Well, that would explain why he's still alive. They're gonna get him out. They give me what I need. Who's your crew? Sergeant Gary. Kyle? They call him Gaz. He never said anything. John McTavish, SAS, sniper, demolitions, goes by soap. Why? It's classified. <laughs> there he is. Simon Riley. There's no picture. Never. Now the rest. That's neat to know. Unless we got a deal. What are you calling this task force? One four one. And I loved it. That's right. Commander Shepard pulled some files from you. Price wants to start a new team consisting of Kyle Garrick, who is Gaz, John Soap McTavish, and Simon Ghost Riley, otherwise known as Task Force 141. When I had initially streamed my campaign run on Mixer, I was not expecting this scene. I lost my shit, and I was very happy. My hype for Modern Warfare 2 was off the charts, and this was only the campaign. Some people may have a problem with Kyle being Gaz, but we need to remember, this game is a reboot, not a continuation. They made some changes, and while this Gaz is not the old Gaz, it's still a nice reveal. After the credits, yet another scene plays out showing that this story does continue, but in Spec Ops. A new leader of Alcatala is on the rise. Viktor Zakayev and Al-Assad are in the equation now. Some familiar names. And with that, you're left to choose your next step. Take on Spec Ops or play multiplayer. Or Warzone, now that that's finally released. Overall, with this short campaign, I was on board throughout all of it. Every mission, in my opinion, was pretty fun and engaging, albeit short. I felt Barkov could have used a little more exposition, as I really didn't feel an emotional impact upon his death. Maybe I'm just alone in that regard, but I felt the wolf was just a more convincing enemy, a terrorist leader shown in the first moments of the campaign. Besides my minor nitpicks, I really did love this story. It told a, while exaggerated, tale of modern combat, similar to the how the original COD 4 did showcasing the brutality of war. There's complexity and morality even when killing. Price says it best. Even war has a high ground. Stay on it. The game showed some horrific scenes and choices that were made by characters. Pushing that guy over the ledge in Piccadilly, while absolutely the best option, had some weight. And it had me thinking, oh fuck, they're not shying away this time. The game could have easily had you been that super soldier in these scenes saving everyone and anyone. But not every situation is going to go as planned. There's casualties in war, even innocence. While hardly anyone buys a Call of Duty title for the campaign, the campaign was fun and engaging throughout, and I would highly recommend it to anyone who likes shooting things and a story that's fun and pretty easy to understand. It's not rocket science. It's a COD campaign. But I loved it. Spec Ops leaves a lot to be desired. At launch, Spec Ops consisted of four special operations and one classic mission. With the survival mode being a PlayStation exclusive until one year after release, so Xbox and PC players won't get to see survival until the next Call of Duty out, 
not until after this game's life cycle. Being an Xbox pleb, I can't accurately give a personal take on survival, but from my understanding, it's nothing really too spectacular. The four launch missions consist of Special Operation Headhunter, Colvada, Paladin, and Crosswind. These four missions ask you to do what is essentially the same thing. Go to this location, do some menial task, kill people, wait for evac. Completing these four launch operations will net you the Operator Zane, which I hardly see anyone running in multiplayer, so I'm content with having him unlocked and running him. Quite honestly, the bulk of these operations were not super engaging or fun to me, but these missions do have a canonical place in the story. Taking place after the main campaign, these missions task you with finding intel on the new Alcatala leaders and their operations. While Spec Ops technically does have a story, I found it to be quite lackluster and not engaging. The overall gameplay of these missions is fine, but the game just throws waves and waves of enemies at you. There's hardly really a break. You kill one wave of enemies, and four seconds later, there's more shooting at you. It's tedious more than anything just to finish these missions. The insane amount of enemies, on top of the fact that these maps aren't really small, means that you'll be getting shot at from multiple angles. The insane amount of enemies on top of the fact that these maps are quite large means that you can be getting shot at from multiple angles and not even know from where. It just feels like the large amount of enemies is artificial inflation of the difficulty. The missions themselves wouldn't be too hard if it threw a decent amount of enemies at you, but it just throws so much at you that it does become difficult. These missions are only able to be played with four people, meaning that if you don't have a full squad of people you know, then good luck getting a super competent team. Sometimes people quit because these missions do take a little bit longer than others. Sometimes they just keep dying and now you're essentially down a man if you cannot pull off the revive. But even with a full squad of competent players that know what they're doing, you'll find these missions to be just as tedious as without. Wave after wave of enemies essentially means that if you want to guarantee that your team survives, one player will most likely be hiding out in a spot that's hard to reach to ensure the team can respawn. Because if you cannot be revived, you'll bleed out and have to wait a predetermined amount of time until the rest of the squad can come back into the fight via an airplane. So on missions like the one where you go to the stadium, I found myself or one teammate respawning and camping on top of the stadium with a sniper so that the teammates can go for the objectives. But if they were to die, you'd be able to wait a few minutes and then everyone would come back. Essentially, you're unkillable if you're on top of that stadium. The missions would be so much better if they didn't just keep throwing enemies at you. That's essentially what this mode comes down to. You don't get a break. And even with the proper field upgrades and role selection, it just falls back into the same grind every time. You just shoot a bunch of enemies, try not to die, and just keep holding into cover and camping until you have a moment to get to the next objective. I should probably explain the munitions and role selections while I'm here, just so if you haven't played it you can have a slight understanding. Munitions are essentially your streaks. From an ammo crate, UAV, juggernaut, or gunship, you can select any of these items before a match, but you'll also be able to find these munition boxes around the map, so you'll never really be empty. Basically, the higher tier streaks will cost a lot more points, which you can spend before the game, so if you want to use a juggernaut, he'll cost a couple thousand points. These points are pretty easy to come by, so I wouldn't be too worried about spending them. Your role selection is basically what ultimate you get. Think of it like your operator abilities from Black Ops 3 and 4. You can select between a heavy duty armor drop, stopping power rounds, a thermite launcher, recon drone, EMP drone, and a team revive. Each of these comes with a passive ability. I found myself using the medic role more often than not. It just makes reviving easier and quicker. Being able to get all your squad mates up with the click of a button was a really big plus. I find that most people are going to choose between three of the classes, the one that gives you the team revive, stopping power rounds, and the armor drop. So these systems are in place to make spec ops a little bit easier, but just the huge amount of waves of enemies that the game will drop at you makes it so that your resources deplete super quick. And if the large scale special ops missions don't really tickle your fancy, then you still have the option of the classic missions. On launch there was one, safeguard which is essentially a survival map. Your chomper gets shot down and you must hold off until evac arrives. Just like the other missions, the game just throws more and more enemies at you, hardly giving you much of a break. 
the gameplay just always comes down to shooting seamlessly endless hordes of enemies. As of recording this section, there are five other classic missions to choose from besides Safeguard. And these missions are more in line with the things that you would have in Modern Warfare 2 and 3. They're shorter segments taking not nearly as long, but fall mostly into the same pattern. Go to this place, kill a bunch of people, get out. Sometimes you gotta do another objective, like defuse a bomb or pick up some intel from computers, but it's all really the same stuff as the others. And the missions have you essentially replaying areas from the campaign or multiplayer. That can either be a plus or a negative, depending on how you feel the maps were designed. I don't find anything super unique about these missions, and I just didn't really have a ton of fun. The mission Pitch Black seems promising at first. It utilizes the same map layout as Going Dark from the campaign, so I thought that this would just be a fun stealth mission similar to what the campaign mission had, you just don't have to play through all the beginning and end of it, you can just play the stealth. But no. It's just the same old go to these locations and kill people. But this time with night vision goggles. None of your weapons are silenced, so being stealthy wasn't even an option from the get-go. Spec Ops as a whole just feels... off. The missions aren't really unique enough for me to want to play them again and beat my own record. There's no super stealthy mission, no vehicle mission like the snowmobile one from MW2, it's just the same stuff, over and over. And unless you're a completionist, I find it hard to say that Spec Ops is a portion of the game that you should spend time in. Which sucked, because in the marketing, they kind of made it seem like it's some giant return to form, and that these missions were going to be something like Modern Warfare 2 and 3 with varying objectives. But no, it just feels like an empty shell of what it could be. It has potential, but it isn't realized in the slightest. With only two major sections of this video to go, we're finally getting into the thing that people buy a Call of Duty game for, it's multiplayer. This is the section we'll actually dive deep into the core gameplay and gunplay as well, as this is the most effective way into explaining how the game plays. While the mechanics are the same across all the modes, the flaws of how the game actually plays is only really shown to its full extent in multiplayer, where everybody has these same tools at their disposal. When everybody has these mechanics to use, all these flaws might come out. On launch, the multiplayer did have a decent selection of modes. Your standard Call of Duty modes are available, such as the core and hardcore variations of Team Deathmatch, Domination, Kill Confirmed, Free For All, s and the usual. As well as a new take on the classic Ground War mode and the new Gunfight mode. But more on that later. The base game came out with about 9 6v6 maps, about 7 gunfight maps, 1 ground war map, and 4 to 5 10v10 maps. That number now being much higher than it was on launch as more content keeps getting added throughout the game's life. Keep in mind that I could have the wrong information here, but this game by no means has the lowest amount of maps by any mean from a Call of Duty installment. The game has a different mix of map styles, which has actually pissed off the community more than I would think. Maybe it's just a vocal minority, but I see so many people complaining about the game and its maps all the time. Some criticisms are definitely valid, and some are just annoying. Like when they recently released Backlot, which is a map from COD 4, I saw so many comments saying things like, Oh, they ruined it! Everywhere I went. Then, when someone asked what was wrong with it, their response was, Well, they added so many doors! Like, fuck off, dude. If doors are what make or break a map for you, you need to have some better taste. But before I get into an in-depth discussion about doors and their implications, I should briefly describe these maps. I'm not gonna go over every single nook and cranny, but a brief description in what people like and don't like. First off is Anaya Palace, or Anaya Incursion. It's a map I feel is kinda meh. On release, we only had the Palace variant, which is fucking gigantic. Like on a 6v6 or a 10v10 match on this map, it was not uncommon for the game to end due to time rather than the score. The main meat of the map, which is what Incursion is now, is just fine. I don't hate it, most of the fights tend to happen within or around the direct vicinity of the palace itself, but every single map has its hot points. No map will be perfectly balanced to where all fights happen more or less in a given area. But palace on launch was very annoying. 
Because after dying, if you spawned in the far back of the map, you had to run so damn far that by the time you got to a fight, the match was pretty much over. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you get the point. The palace is broken up into two floors, with different avenues of getting to the second floor on each side, meaning both teams can fight for control of the palace itself. The map now, in its normal 6v6 mode, is the Incursion variant, which makes a large chunk of the far ends of the map out of bounds. I don't hate it. It's not the best map, but it's far more suited for big team battle modes. Arklov Peak, another one of the larger maps, I personally like a lot much more than Anaya. It's just another large-scale three-lane map with a few different cut-throughs to get from side to side. There are two main buildings on either side of that middle section of the map where people tend to go. Overall, it kind of falls into what Anaya does, which is the back spawns are hardly ever fought in or used. They're just so far back, but nowhere near as much of a trek as Anaya was. Atlas Superstore, a post-launch map, is another map I actually tend to enjoy. It kind of goes against what most people tend to say about it. It's large, but it's easy to traverse. There's not too many long-range engagements areas in it, but there are a few places that you could snipe from. People tend to not like this map just because it has so many places to climb on and move out from. There's lots of boxes, lots of corners to hide in, so it kind of lends people to try to camp a little bit more. I myself don't have a major problem with it, and I tend to have fun on this map, but I do understand the criticisms people have for it. Azir Cave is also a map people don't seem to like much. Again, I'm okay with it. A lot of the fighting takes place in and around the cave area, leaving kill streaks that actually get kills kind of useless, but I think the cave in and of itself and its surrounding areas give a good amount of leeway for utilizing different playstyles. The cliff side of the map is hardly ever used aside from headquarters where there's an objective over there, and aside from the rare flank maneuver, you won't really see too many people over there. But overall, it gives options as to whether you want to run and gun with an SMG or use a sniper. There's a decent amount of wiggle room for running on different sets. The cave itself has a front and back entrance with two side entrances that people can kind of use to flank. Overall, I think people's main problem with this map comes with those side entrances. It's pretty common to have someone holding an angle on these corners and shooting you as soon as you come in. Overall, I think the map's okay. Not stellar, but I tend to have a good time on it. Crash is another remake of the COD 4 Classic. It plays pretty much the same as the others. There's a couple new perches that you can use to mount on, but for the most part, it's the same old Crash you know. There's nothing too different. It's a map I enjoy. Euphrates Bridge, yet another large map. I'm not a huge fan of this one. It's definitely grown on me from launch, but for the most part, a game on this map tends to just revolve around controlling that bridge itself, which on launch, I found myself getting spawn trapped a lot, and it led me to hate this map. It's definitely gotten better. I can play it now without wanting to die, but it's a map I'm never really excited to play. But it's good for sniper challenges though, being it is a pretty big map. Granza Raid is a damn good map in my book. Each of the spawns have two-story buildings that, if one chooses, you could perch up with a sniper and take out enemies from the other side. It doesn't give you full control of an area, as most of the fights are happening towards the middle of the map, which has a lot of buildings and obstructions. So don't expect sniping to net you a ton of kills, but the option is there. I think the games on this map flow pretty well, but there is a lot of hiding spots for campers in those corners, because there's just so many buildings but you can never really get rid of the problem of campers fully. The next two maps are probably the most loved of the game, and I can see why. Hackney Yard and Gunrunner, both top tier maps in my book. Gunrunner is larger than Hackney, but both are small enough to where it's not super hectic, but fights still happen all over the map. I think they balance these maps very well, and there's different power positions that can be flanked from multiple different angles. Different core options, and overall, I think that these are the best two maps in the game. Any playstyle really does work on these, and they're both fun maps to play on. Havoc Sawmill is another post-launch map, and it's alright to play on. I have no major gripes with it. It's a solid map, lending itself more towards an AR and SMG playstyle. Condor Hideout is another post-launch map. It has a lot of buildings, lots of places to run from, with some long-range positions to utilize. I think I like Sawmill more than Hideout, but this is all personal in terms of what map is good or not. You may love or hate these maps, and that's perfectly fine. The main reason I'm not going into huge detail on these maps is because I'm not a game or map designer. I don't do this for a living, so I'm not trying to speak with too much authority as, as to what makes a map good or not. Probably the most divisive of all the maps in Modern Warfare is Piccadilly. Where do I begin? 
the map can be much smaller. The two spawns are far enough back in the street that it just feels like a chore running all the way back into the middle. In the grand scheme of it, it's probably not a super long run, but it definitely feels like it. There's an underground section of the map that hardly anyone uses, and you'll probably find most of the people in this map are at the buses, library, or construction areas. Or there's that guy who camps on top of the section of the Sheik store. Overall, the map doesn't really flow too well. It looks really nice, and I like how it's a real place, but people fucking hate this map. And while I don't think it's the best, I definitely don't think it's the worst. I think it could be much better with the buses being moved, and I think that if they were in different orientations and the back spawns were being pushed up so you didn't have to run a half marathon to get back into the fight, that Piccadilly could be a solid contender. There's just a few things that make it quite annoying to play on. Ramaza is yet another map I enjoy. Lots of people taking favor over the second story areas of this map, but I feel like it flows pretty well and I don't have too many major complaints. It's a solid map overall. Rust and Shipment were added post-launch and are just those remakes of those maps that you remember. Shipment has some slight changes, unlike Rust, which include a new container that you can get inside the top of, but for the most part, it's just a clusterfuck. It's just as hectic as I remember. When I play Rust or Shipment, I know what I'm getting into. You shouldn't expect to have the most thought-provoking match on these maps. It's just hectic and chaotic fun. The spawns can get a little fucky, but again, they're super small, so it's kind of bound to happen. Shoot House is a map people fucking love, and they don't shut the fuck up about it when they remove it from a playlist. More on that in a few. But the map itself is good. It's three lane, two perches on either side of the map, making it real easy to get mounted long shots, which I do if I need to get that challenge done. The map's good. I like it. You can snipe, run with an SMG, and use almost anything. It's a map I have fun on. I see why people love it. St. Petrograd is there. I think it's fine. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's basically two long buildings with streets on the inner side. There's options on both sides of the map to camp and snipe, but there's enough cover that you can bob and weave and kind of avoid being sniped and picked off. It's a decently fast-paced map on a usual playthrough, so don't expect something too special from this one. Vacant from MW2 is back and plays pretty much the same as MW2 Vacant, to me at least. It's fast paced, snipers usually at the edges of the windows from spawns. It's vacant. It's fun, it's pretty much what you remember. With many more maps being added over the post launch support, I definitely think that there is a really good selection of maps to play in Modern Warfare. Again, I'm not a designer, so I can't speak to as to what the best kind of map is, but I like how Infinity Ward has a mix of three-lane maps and non-traditional maps with varying sizes. Some maps are definitely too big, but I could see them falling into a problem that Treyarch kind of did, where almost every single map turning into a three-lane map, they all just kind of become the same, so I like the variety. I've had some bad experiences which make me dislike some maps more than other, but there is no map that I'll back out of a lobby for. But then again, Call of Duty tends to have some pretty decent map design. With a few meh or not good maps once in a while, they're usually solid maps. In this game, being as the style is modern realism, a lot of the maps do have the same kind of scheme. Lots of browns, slightly washed away colors, but I don't find them to usually be too bland or uninspired. Overall, I think there could be a little bit more color on the maps in this game, but it's not like COD Ghost where everyone said it was just different colors of gray. Definitely a major complaint that a lot of people had about that game. Most of the maps do play similarly throughout these different modes, with people running similar routes throughout each game mode. Unless the objective is somewhere super specific, you can usually find and pick out where people are going to be in the similar areas. Overall, the game modes function well. As stated earlier, the basic COD modes return. New ones, like Cyber Attack which is pretty much search and rescue. The goal is to plant an EMP, but if you die, you can be revived. So there's no respawns, but there is an option to get back into the game. There's more modes now than there was at launch, so you definitely have some options. The quick play option is a nice feature that I'm glad they added. You can select whatever modes you don't mind playing, and quick play will just find a match based on that. It's good for people like me who really don't care if they're playing Domination, Kill Confirmed, Capture the Flag. I like them all, so whenever they're selected in quick play, and whatever I play is what I play, I don't mind it too much. It's a nice feature to have, it's a welcome change. The game does have limited time modes, which changes quite frequently. Which is where that statement about Shoot House comes in. Like, there's a mode called Shoot the Ship, which is basically Shoot House and Shipment only on a variety of different modes. 
or mode akin to the Chaos Mosh Pit, which is pretty much small maps in another Mosh Pit mode. They'll rotate these out every once in a while just to try to keep the game fresh is my take. But as soon as a playlist that had Shoot House in it goes away, all I fucking see in Twitter's replies is Shoot House 24-7. Like, oh my fucking god, it'll come back one day, quit whining, and play some other game mode or just a new fucking game for a week. You'll be okay, you will live. These LTMs could be modes like Drop Zone or Cranked, and they even did the same thing with Infected and Gun Game, but now those are in the quick play options, so you never know what they're really gonna do. I personally would love to see All or Nothing from MW3 come back, that was a ton of fun, but that's just my personal opinion. Overall, I think the variety of modes is fine. I can see why people would be upset over a mode that they liked being removed, but I've seen it on Twitter so much that now it just annoys me. Core is fine, Hardcore is fine, I usually don't play Hardcore, but it's just like the others, limited HUD, limited health. I do wish we could see how many people were online. In the old CODs, they would tell you how many people were online and how many people are in what mode. It lets you know what was populated so you could tell what game mode is worth looking for. Then they swapped it to a percentage system, but they probably introduced that to kinda hide their lower player numbers. But with how many people decided to download and play Warzone, I don't think COD is dying. But in this game, there's no gauge for how many people are playing what mode, which is okay for now, but the older a game gets, the less people are going to play it. So in, say, four years, you might be looking for a game on Search and Destroy in this, but never find one because the game doesn't tell you how many people are playing. It's the little things like that that annoy me. I also liked the rank-up meter from games like COD 4. I'd like that back with the toggle on and off option in the settings, but I'm probably in the minority for that, so I've just made peace. The main complaint people have about the multiplayer, not including its core gameplay, is the lobbies. There is no persistent lobbies in this game. You finish a match, and you're thrown right back into searching for a new one. Gone were the days of talking shit to people in the lobby and waiting for that rematch. There's also no map voting. In previous CODs, when going back to the lobby, there was three choices of maps to play. Two that you knew, and one that was a random choice. You can't do that here. The game tells you which map you're going to play, and nobody gets to say otherwise. Which is probably their way of making sure all maps get to be played to some extent, but taking away that choice for players gives many a sour taste. So I'd say, keep persistent lobbies and bring back map voting. They're basic things, and I really don't understand why they were taken out. I care more about persistent lobbies than I do map voting, but I can see both sides of this argument. Both are features that should be in the game. Trials exist in the game, but they only exist really to just give you slightly more XP if you choose to do them. They're just small missions, like do this shooting range, kill these enemies, you get the point. They're small, and I haven't met one person who thinks that Trials are the greatest addition to COD since the pick 10. Which, I guess it's a nice option to have, but if you're like me, the tickets for those Trials would just pile up, and you'll never really use them. The Trials section is also where you would access the custom games and game battles if you're an MLG pro like me. The two main modes left here are Ground War and Gunfight. Gunfight being basically that face-off playlist from MW3, a mode I absolutely adored back in that game. In Gunfight, you typically cannot pick your class, instead the game gives the same weapon loadout to every person in the game, and everyone gets one life. The maps are very small and typically symmetrical, so no team gets a clear advantage. Some maps like Hill, which, fuck that one, or Pine, have very slight variations in the spawn area, but for the most part, every gunfight map could be just flipped over onto itself, and it would be the same. Most of these maps are fine and quite fun, depending on what gun you get. If one team fails to win within a certain amount of time, a flag point opens up in the direct middle of the map. Whoever caps that first wins the round. First to six wins. The default gunfight mode is 2v2 but sometimes they'll sprinkle in a 1v1, 3v3, or some other minor variations like snipers only or allowing to actually pick your own class. Overall, I love gunfight. It's fast paced, and it's intense, competitive, and it's good if you've got a competent teammate. I think it's a solid addition to the game. I just wish the 1v1 and 3v3 variants were standard as well. Last up is the reimagining of Ground War. So Ground War is quite different in Modern Warfare as compared to some of the other CODs. It's not just a slightly bigger team on the same maps, no. It's 64 people on giant fucking maps. Ground War plays just like Battlefield Conquest. Five flags are on the map to capture. 
there's squad mates that you can use to spawn on so you don't have to run halfway around the world just to get to the action, and there's vehicles to make faster traversal. Options like an ATV, tank, or helicopter. There's mobility options, you're not just stuck to boots on the ground. My personal favorite map is the Quarry, which was the one that we played in the beta. It's large, but has enough tight corners and indoor spaces to where you're not really being sniped at all times. There's a giant tower, and if you can get on top of it, it basically lets you see almost everything. Farmland is more open with less hiding spots, but has a decent amount of buildings. District is in a city where most people can just camp with a sniper on top of the buildings. It gets quite annoying. Port, which I think is a pretty solid map as well, giving good options between sniping and running gun. I really only don't like District. The city setting is fine, but there's just so many goddamn snipers on the top of the roofs that I find myself running around the streets not really finding anyone for extended periods of time. If your team captures all five flags, then there's a limited amount of time before a nuke drops and the game ends. It's pretty damn stressful when that DEFCON element comes up on your HUD and that you know your team is seconds away from crushing defeat. Sometimes your team can get a flag back, but every once in a while the enemy team is pushed so far up that you're essentially trapped in your spawn, forced to sit there as a nuke comes to fuck your shit up. Overall, I enjoy Ground War. It's fun with a full crew, well, any mode is really heightened with your friends. The only main gripe I have, sometimes tanks are in cheeky little spots making it hard to kill them. I'm looking at you, Quarry. When tanks make it to the top of that ledge, it is an absolute nightmare. In my opinion, the biggest problem with Ground War is the fact that there is a lot of camping going on. But I think that might just come up to territory. If you have a super large map, odds are you're going to have a lot of people that want to do their sniper camos and are just going to sit back and try to pick off as many people as they can. At least most of the maps in the Ground War playlist do have plenty of options for being out of the open, but it's still kind of unavoidable that there are going to be a lot of moments where you're getting killed from every single direction because there's somebody sniping far back off in the map. Sometimes, Ground War can be a bit too hectic for my taste, but it's a huge step in a different direction from what COD usually has for Ground War. I think Modern Warfare has a mode and map for every playstyle. Don't like small games? Play Ground War. Want something small and quick? Seem Deathmatch, free for all, and there's options. They've definitely made strides in the right directions when it comes to options for multiplayer. But you can make good choices in terms of maps and modes, but if your gameplay sucks, does it really matter? Call of Duty has always had really solid gunplay, and Modern Warfare is no exception. Guns feel, look, and sound more real than they ever have. Each gun has different recoil patterns and attachments that which you can change to your liking. Each gun tends to be unique in some way. If you want a powerful, accurate AR, pick the Odin. It packs a punch, but is slow to fire. You want a powerful and quick AR, the AK works, it's just not a laser. With SMGs, you can choose the fast, small, fast-firing, large mag P90, or the AUG or MP5, which are SMG weight, but with AR-like range. For every class, there's an option. And it all comes down to the create a class system, which goes back to the classic three-perk, two-weapon system. No more pick 10. Which I'm fine with. If every single COD had a pick 10, I would get bored so quick. I'm glad Infinity Ward isn't just copying Treyarch with their class design. In your first perk slot, you have the perks that you're kinda used to. Scavenger, Cold-Blooded, EOD, which is Flak Jacket. Double Time lets you crouch walk faster and increases your tactical sprint time. Kill Chain lets kills from your streaks count towards the next streak, kinda like MW2 did. Quick Fix lets you start healing as soon as you're not being shot. In slot 2, you have perks like Overkill, Ghost, Hardline, as well as High Alert, which is like in other CODs, a perk that will highlight your HUD when someone you can't see is looking at you. Restock fills your equipment over time, Point Man turns your kill streaks into point streaks, and that's it for slot 2. Slot 3 will give you perks like Tune Up that lets you charge your field upgrade faster, Amped giving you quicker weapon swapping as well as your rocket launcher reload speed, Shrapnel which gives you an extra lethal, Battle Hardened is basically Tack Mask, lessening the stun effects, Spotter which is Sit Rep letting you see enemies equipment, and finally Tracker which lets you see enemies footsteps. It's fine. Most perks are fine. I find myself running Ghost, Battle Hardened, and Cold Blooded more often than not. It helps me stay out of view from all the streaks in the UAVs. I've seen my fair share of complaints about perks in this game, such as Ghost, which always has that UAV effect on. In some more recent CODs, you had to be moving to be invisible to the UAV. 
I personally prefer it this way, but I do see that frustration in always being off radar, which could lead to more camping. The only time I use any other perk is when I go for challenges, so it's like other CODs. There's perks for different playstyles, but I always find myself gravitating towards the perks that help me with streaks. In your lethals, you have the usual. Frag, Simtex, Throwing Knife, C4. The Molotov and Thermite being almost the same thing, usually not killing people unless they get stuck with them, but it forces them to move or else they die. The only main difference being Thermite does more damage to vehicles. I think that's how it works at least, don't quote me on it. It's definitely easier to hit a vehicle with a Thermite as opposed to a Simtex, so whatever, it helps me. But the bane of all COD players' existence, the Claymore. It's usually not a big deal, but Infinity Ward managed to make the Claymore so unbalanced it's not even funny to most people. The thing's explosive radius is seemingly huge, and it could kill you from more than just head-on. Its lasers at one point were so dim that you couldn't even see them. And the thing that is still a problem, it had next to no delay. In previous CODs, if you ran into a Claymore, you had like a second or so to react and then nope the fuck out of the door. But in this game, nope. As soon as you hear the click, you're as good as dead. Might as well put down the controller, because the odds of you evading this thing are so damn low, you might as well play the lottery. I mean, sure, there's the spotter perk, which shows you the claymore and lets you actually hack it, but if you aren't running that, then good fucking luck. Why is there not a delay on claymores? Who thought that that was a good idea? If they added a delay, it wouldn't be nearly as frustrating to die to one. Oh, but there's also bouncing betties, which nobody uses. I tend to, because I don't want to use the claymore, and at least you can evade those ones. I'm giving everyone a fair chance when I plant my explosives. In your tacticals, you have the usual again. Stun, flash, smoke, decoy. There's a snapshot grenade which shows you enemy outlines for a second, which I think is pretty underused. It's good in most situations. Gas grenades are used to slow down enemies and basically fuck with their vision. Heartbeat sensor, which I think I've seen like one person use. And a lot of people seem to run stim. Understandably so. One injection of this sweet drug heals you right up, and it refreshes your tactical sprint. Lastly, you have your secondary weapons. Guns like the 1911, X16, M19 are basic, and I don't really use them, unless I'm trying to do challenges. The Magnum is good, rank it up enough and you'll get snake shot rounds, which basically makes it the executioner from Black Ops 2, which is pretty damn good. But my overall favorite is always the Deagle. It's powerful, easy to use, and looks good. It's my personal choice of sidearm. Then you have launchers, two that are lock-on on the vehicles, and the RPG and the Strela, which are free-fire only. They're fine, they take care of streaks, and you can annoy people with the RPG and pubs if you do so desire. There's also a knife secondary, which, for those who like the melee build, there you go. I mentioned snake shot on the Magnum, so let me explain some weapon customization. Each weapon has attachments, groundbreaking, I know. Some attachments are shared between weapons, and some are unique, like the snake shot rounds or the M16 barrel on the M4. Each weapon, with the exception of launchers and knives, have anywhere between 7 and 9 different attachment classes, such as barrel, optic, perk, underbarrel, etc. You have a total of 5 different attachment slots to use. There's a ton of attachments in this game, meaning you can build a gun to your exact liking. Some attachments block you from putting another one on a different slot, but that's not really too common. On the underbarrel, you can use a grip for recoil or even a launcher. Different barrel lengths, grips, stocks, all giving different benefits and drawbacks. There's so many options that I'm not even going to attempt to explain them all. Odds are, if there's a way you want to use a particular weapon, you could probably kit it to perform that way. Weapon perks are like proficiencies from MW3. Sleight of hand, FMJ, faster melee, there's options for perks. I tend to use sleight of hand on most guns, but some prefer other options. It's all up to you. Each of your attachments and perks unlock at a different weapon level. And there is a lot of them. Some weapons having more than 70 levels. And that might seem like it's a lot, and it is kind of a grind, but you can level your weapons up pretty quick. I never found myself really hating how long it took. On paper, yes, it sounds strenuous, but it's not really as bad as it looks. The final set of camos and its subsequent challenges are unlocked close to the end of the weapon's max level. They're your usual challenges, headshots, crouch kills, all attachments, no attachments, so on. Completing all of the camos gives you gold, which is very nice in this game. Though gold does look a little more filled on some weapons than others, it's a nice camo. It's gold, but it's a different enough version to stand out from some of the other variations in different Call of Duties. 
Completing all the weapon camos for that specific class will give you platinum, which is basically a shiny gray metal sheet over your gun. It looks nice, but on some weapons it's not super noticeable. Getting every single camo for every base gun will net you Damascus, a camo that has a swivel pattern much like gold but with blue, red, and orange-like tints and accents. I didn't like it at first, but it's definitely grown on me the more I've played the game. I find myself going for Damascus as I really enjoy this game, and it's a fun grind in my eyes to use all these different weapons. It's tedious, but it's optional. Besides camos, you have different reticles for different sites unlocked by doing specific challenges. Charms for weapons can be unlocked by purchase or in battle pass tiers, as well as stickers. Unlocked the same way as charms. Same with the sprays that you can use on walls. The charms and stickers are kind of meh. I hardly ever use the stickers, and I really only use the koala charm, as that's from the bundle that helps support those Australian bushfires. But there's a ton of options for weapon customization, far more than any other Call of Duty game, and that's pretty impressive. For the most part, I think Infinity Ward knocked it out of the park in this aspect. Character customization is toned down from some other games. There is operators that you can unlock from doing some challenges, and some being exclusively behind a paywall. They're only cosmetic, so I have absolutely no problem with any of them. They all look decently realistic, with the exception of a few. I tend to run Ghost and Zane. You may have other preferences. You do tend to see a lot of the same character, though. Like, a lot of people ran Ghost for a bit, and a lot of people are now running Igor and Alex. Uh, it's pretty much whatever characters in the Battle Pass gets ran a lot. It's no big deal. We've talked a lot about multiplayer, but haven't even mentioned how the game plays. We're almost done here, and I haven't even mentioned the slide mechanic or mounting mechanic more than just in passing. Well, I, f I did that because I felt it was important to explain all the other facets of the game in order to get the bigger picture. Things like sliding or mounting may seem small, but in conjunction with everything else in terms of weapon customization, setting, it really is important to understand all these facets of the game before discussing how it plays itself. The core gameplay is Call of Duty. The only main real difference being that some of the maps have doors on them, which, if you just run through, makes a loud noise, and there you go. No door is really holding you back from getting a position. If you go ADS and hold the open door button, then you can peek through it. Makes a little squeaking noise, but is a little more inconspicuous. I really don't understand the hate for the doors in this game, but a lot of people don't like them. A lot of people don't tend to use them either, so typically when they're open, they're open, and if they get closed, then odds are someone's in that building. So, I really don't see the hate towards doors. I mean, they could not be there, and I wouldn't care either way. It's just another feature that hardly anyone really pays attention to. I think just some people are nitpicking it. But overall, that core gameplay is still the same gameplay you know from all the other Call of Duty games. The controls are easy, responsive, and you can learn them pretty quickly. Some mechanics return, like sliding, which I definitely think is better than diving, and some problematic options return. Call of Duty only tried leaning a couple times, and it comes back here, with the mounting mechanic. Mounting is much more than leaning. You mount, go figure, your weapon to a surface while aiming and clicking the melee button. Your weapon will have significantly less sway, and it will be easier to control the recoil. All while keeping most of your character behind cover. People don't like this mechanic as they see it as a way of incentivizing camping. Which, yeah, in a way it does, but camping in a Call of Duty game was always a thing. It's never going to go away. Mounting gives you advantages, but it also leaves you pretty vulnerable. You can't move 360 degrees, and while you can unmount, that takes a small amount of time that if unmounted, you could easily use to just turn around and kill whoever's coming for you. I liked the leaning and mounting feature from Ghost, and I'm fine with it here. Sure, it can be annoying to be killed by a player that's camped up and mounted on a wall somewhere, but it's not like without mounting, nobody would camp. You have your tactical sprint, which by double clicking the sprint button enables you to move much faster for a short amount of time. I see it as a welcome change. There is no perk directly tied to movement speed, so the tax sprint is a nice option to combat that. And with stims, you can recharge your tax sprint pretty often. On maps that aren't super small, there is a slight respawn delay. After skipping the kill cam, you'll spawn from a top-down aerial view. It takes just a second. It looks nice at first, but eventually it just feels like a way to slow the game down. Spawning plays a quick animation, usually of you chambering around into your weapon. It's quick, I doubt it will get you killed, but overall the respawning system is okay, but artificially slowed down with that overhead respawn mechanic. 
I just don't get the reason as to why it's there. As mentioned earlier, your weapons do have weight. Obviously, SMGs are faster to handle than LMGs, so that logic holds true here. You can snap on the enemies easier with light weapons as opposed to heavies. Sniper scopes now have glint, meaning that if you're scoped in, you can see an approximation of where they are. It's a nice change, because if there's a sniper scope on a DMR, regular sniper, or whatever, it helps balance their range. In previous CODs, if someone was bush camping without a glint, that they'd be hard to spot. It's a welcome change in my book. The different attachment options could speed up or slow down the handling of your weapon. But just like in most CODs, the gunplay is pretty top notch. The guns sound like they're packing a punch. You can learn how to fully utilize a weapon and almost all guns are an option in some way or another. It's not like Advanced Warfare where the ball and the ASM were the only clear cut options. Sure at launch the M4 and 725 were OP, but that's why we have updates. These guns have since been balanced and pretty much everything is viable. And I like having choices without having a clear handicap. So the base gunplay and movement is fine. Mounting is a problem to some people, but overall I'd say the game is responsive. It's not as fast paced as some of the others, but your character isn't slow like say a one speed from Siege. You have mobility options like tack sprint, sliding, and mantling objects. A strange choice was made for this game though. Forgo the usual score streaks in favor of returning to where it all started, kill streaks. While in concept, going back to killstreaks is cool nostalgia for a bit, it doesn't really help to incentivize team play. If you're close to a streak, camping an objective won't really do anything for you. Yeah, there's a perk for turning them into score streaks, but realistically, who's going to use that over the other options? The streaks themselves are pretty hit or miss for me. The shield turret is damn near useless, the personal radar is nice for a poor man's UAV, but it gives away your position. The basic streaks return like a UAV, counter UAV, and care package. There's an attack chopper and so on. White phosphorus being a napalm strike, which is a war crime, and it does damage over time and leaves the map smoky for a bit. The VTOL jet is the Harrier from MW2, and the gunship is the AC-130. Juggernaut armor makes a comeback, but I hardly see anyone using it. Being as it's 15 kills to get, I doubt too many people are worried about using it. But when you do get the jug armor, I do love the little addition to having heavy metal music playing in it. You do have the option to turn it on and off though. I think at the very least that the streaks should, at the minimum, go back to MW3's variation. Kills will refill that meter, and playing an objective can refill part or a full section of that meter too. So kills wouldn't matter, but so would playing an objective. MW3 system is pretty much just a variation of the now normal score streak option, and I think that that would help incentivize more team play. I don't hate kill streaks, I just like score streaks better. Another major problem I have is how long it takes to destroy kill streaks. Shooting down a VTOL jet takes more than three rockets. Given I could subsidize my lack of launcher ammo with scavenger, but then I'm exposed to the streaks, and I don't really recall streaks being this hard to take down. Not hard as in difficult to lock on or shoot, but hard as in it takes a shit ton to bring them down. If a team focuses fire, then yeah, it's usually no big issue, but that's not going to really happen every time. The main argument for streaks being so hard to take down is that you get them from kills. They're harder to get, and as such, they should feel powerful and take more to take down. Which makes sense in theory, but in practice, some of the streaks are super powerful and take forever to destroy. But then again, being that it's from kills, it makes sense that they're powerful. I'm just not a huge fan of how long it takes. Field upgrades are a new addition to the game, pretty much like an ultimate ability, but not nearly as game changing. There's your munitions box that gives ammo to you and your team, stopping power rounds, tech insertion, recon drone, dead silence, trophy system, deployable cover, EMP drone, and a weapon crate. People tend to like never use the recon or EMP drone in core, and I mainly see the ammo box, trophy, or dead silence. The cover and tack insertion are used sometimes, but it's more common to see the munitions box around. I don't mind field upgrades, as their equipment isn't really game changing, but it could for sure help turn the tide of a battle. I don't like dead silence being a field upgrade and not a perk, but there's really no changing that now. Stopping power rounds are good on some guns and borderline useless on others, so pick and choose what you're going to use them for. Each field upgrade does have a different amount of time it takes to recharge. The attack insertion is super quick, same with dead silence. The stomping power rounds take a while. Munition box is kind of a middle ground there. So you'll see that in the options menu when you're picking one. 
for the most part, I don't really have an issue with field upgrades. They're just pieces of equipment that are used to help you or your team out. Tech insert, dead silence, trophy system, ammo box, those could all be put into perks or equipment. And quite honestly, I don't think the field upgrade system is needed. It's not awful, it's there, you can use it or not, it's not going to make a really big difference in core. Another big change in Modern Warfare that a lot of people have a problem with is the fact that the radar isn't always active. Yes, you have your minimap in the corner, but players shooting will not light up in a red dot on the map as they have in other CODs. A lot of people have a giant problem with this. The Infinity Ward developers, if I recall correctly, stated that they wanted people to focus on the gameplay itself and not have to focus on looking at the map in the top corner to see where an enemy is. I myself don't have a huge problem with this change to the minimap. I don't have a major gripe with it. A lot of people do because, oh, if somebody's camping, I can't see, you know, kind of where their dot is. But even in other games, you could combat that with suppressor. Overall, I can see people's problem with not having the red dot show up on the minimap, but I really don't think it's a major issue. A small little addition is the fact that before a match even starts, you'll see a little intro cinematic showing your team entering the battlefield. Some games you'll see your characters rappel in through a rope on a helicopter. Other games you might see your team entering through the back of a cargo truck. It's a neat little thing, something that really didn't need to be added, but adds for a little bit more immersion. It's a welcome change, and it's something cool to see before a match starts. Sometimes I've noticed, like in the cargo truck entrance, that it will clip through a gate in the back of the map. So that's just a minor bug, but overall, it's a cool little addition. On the scoreboard, you aren't able to actually see your deaths in most game modes. In pretty much every other Call of Duty title, if you clicked the back button and saw the scoreboard, you would be able to see how many kills you have, deaths, and depending on the mode, how much you've contributed towards the objectives. I don't know why they decided to take out the deaths. My best guess would be that they don't really want you to see how bad you could be doing, but I feel like even in your own mind, you kind of have a gauge if you're doing good or not in a game, so not being able to see the deaths I don't really think is going to impact it that much. I think it should just revert back to the old ways of showing pretty much everything on that scoreboard. A very long overdue addition is finally in this game, and it's the fact that you can edit your classes mid-game. If you don't like your particular attachment setup on whatever gun, you can change that mid-game. Say you're going for challenges for a specific optic on your weapon. You get all the kills with that, or you just don't like the optic you're using, you can switch that and it will change the next time you spawn. Obviously, you're not going to be able to edit your camos or charms or any of that stuff, but being able to change attachments and full-on loadouts in the middle of a game is a welcome change, and I don't know why it took so long to make its way into the Call of Duty franchise. Overall, the core gameplay and multiplayer of Modern Warfare is what you'd expect. It's some decently fast-paced action, good gunplay, and plenty of options. I think the gameplay in itself here is some of COD's best. It has its flaws, but it flows really well. I think the problems that people have is with mounting. Alongside with the less than perfect map design, and in some aspects, it compounds itself and it turns people off. I think most of the maps are pretty good, they're not the best, minus a couple exceptions. The guns are all real looking, sounding, and there's plenty of options. The modes are plentiful, and overall the core multiplayer is a solid experience. I've had more fun with this COD than I have with, say, Black Ops 4 by a long shot. I think the core multiplayer is worth the price. They don't reinvent the wheel, but they change it up just enough so that it's different, but still familiar. And that's where the video would end if Infinity War didn't drop a fourth mode into this game. And now it's time to dive deep into Warzone. Warzone was finally released on March 10th, 2020, free for everyone after many leaks and speculations. But even before those initial leaks, a few people figured out that if you combined all of those Spec Ops maps, it would make up what looked like a Battle Royale map. It only made sense. Each of the Spec Ops mission areas could be seen in the distance while doing any other Spec Ops mission. It was pretty obvious that all of these areas took place in the same geographical location. It was without a doubt intentional, as the individual Spec Ops maps could have easily been created in their own area with generic out-of-bounds assets as opposed to a full detailed map. Regardless, Warzone would be teased a couple weeks before the mode even came out, with a new section in the main menu reading as classified. Hovering over that would show a distorted visual as well as a timer if you looked close enough. 
it was all but confirmed that this new mode would be a battle royale. Some people managed to even glitch themselves into lobbies, while others obtained their information from less than ideal sources. Infinity Ward was quick to strike down any video that exposed the actual visuals from the mode, leaving many upset as the leaks were really all we had to hype us up. While I understand Infinity Ward's reason for striking this content down, they really didn't do a phenomenal job at building up the hype in my opinion. From what I recall, there was no teaser trailer when that original menu section was added, it was really nothing, just radio silence. A little teaser or some sort of information would have been nice. As stated, it was all but confirmed by Infinity Ward that this new mode would be Warzone. Every single tweet sent out by a Call of Duty associated account would receive hundreds of replies saying, release Warzone. Maybe I'm in the minority, but I really think they handled the hype and build up around this mode very poorly. You gotta give people more than just a menu option that gives no information. But enough about me bitching about pre-release, let's talk about the mode. Warzone released for everyone on the same day, no purchase necessary. That's right, a 100% free-to-play mode in the Call of Duty franchise. You didn't need to own Modern Warfare 2019 at all. You could just install and play Warzone with the click of a button. It would only take about a day to download as the file size is giant, but in pretty much any AAA game that's released, I expect it to have a pretty large download, which is kind of why I have an external drive. There were two modes that would see you dropping into this giant battle royale map with a total of 150 players per game, a step up from the typical 100 you see in other BRs. Those two modes are battle royale and plunder. Battle Royale being the typical last team alive wins, while Plunder is having a goal of obtaining the most money to win. The map is giant, composed of those Spec Ops and Ground War maps. This mode would have you dropping into some familiar locations if you played the rest of the game. And I'm a pretty big fan of the map. It has diverse locations, traversal options, and even some secrets hidden about. I quite enjoy dropping at the TV station, which is broadcast from the original Modern Warfare DLC. This location is pretty much in the middle of the map, so it's a hot drop for many players. But zones like Superstore, Downtown, Stadium are pretty popular too. But I do find most locations are utilized in most games. People seem to be dropping in pretty diverse locations, which is nice since it means that people are kind of spread out. Don't get me wrong, I love the hectic gunfights, but if poorly made, a battle royale map will lend itself to just having certain areas that are pretty much never touched. That's not to say every single location is populated. I just see a pretty good variety in people's landing locations and different locations used throughout the games I've played. In the pregame lobby, everyone spawns into a small area with a random weapon. You can sit idly by or murder everyone. Kills in the pregame will actually count towards your weapon XP and unlocks, so technically speaking, you can do some challenges before the game even begins. The game starts up with a cinematic showing your squad in a plane preparing to jump. Like other BRs, you can see the route the plane is taking, but you can also see that first circle. Personally, I would prefer if that first circle didn't reveal itself until everybody touched down, but if it doesn't change, it's not really the end of the world in my eyes. Speaking of the circle, there's gotta be a reason for it, right? Well in this case, it's that gas moving in that shrinks that play area. And the gas here is devastating. Getting stuck in this gas will kill you pretty damn quickly. Luckily, there is a gas mask pickup that'll give you 5 ticks of damage before it breaks, and then you're in deep shit, and you gotta struggle to get out alive. The gas mask will play an animation when putting it on and taking it off, which I think could be condensed into just being one animation of you putting it on and slowly your field of view would just go back to normal without that distortion of goggles. But I could see that the reasoning behind this is that you're really not meant to be in the gas, so the animation is there to show you like, hey, you're not supposed to try and fight people in here, you need to get out now, focus on that. It could definitely be frustrating if you're dying to someone because that animation for the gas mask was playing, which is why I think that one-time animation would be fine. A neat little thing they did, which I love, is that when you're diving towards the map, you can actually see the names of the locations without having to go into the map. It's the little things like that that help you to know clearly where you're going, and I appreciate it very much. It's a feature I didn't really know I wanted or needed until now. You can drop in and deploy your parachute at any time. You can cut the cord at any time and redeploy as well. 
but just to remember to redeploy that parachute before you smack the ground if you've already cut the cord before. Everyone starts off the game with a pistol, a gun you're not really expected to keep, but it gives you something so that if somebody gets a different weapon before you, you technically have a fighting chance. Your health regenerates in typical COD fashion, but you do have armor plates. You can put up to three of these plates on you at any given time. These plates are essentially another layer of health, letting you take more bullets before you die. You can carry five in reserve, or you can find that armor backpack pickup, which will increase your maximum inventory of plates. These work much like Fortnite or Apex. Armor is fine, and the only complaint I really have is that when you put in an armor plate, it only fills up the remainder of that bar that you're currently on. So say out of those three armor slots that you have, you have one and a half filled. Inserting another armor plate will give you up to two layers of armor, not two and a half. I kind of wish it added one full armor plate instead, which maybe they'll change later, I don't really know. You can use the pistol when deploying from the plane, and I've seen many people try to attempt to kill others before they've even landed. I've seen plenty of complaints in that department too, and honestly it hasn't really happened to me, so I don't have too much of an opinion. Personally, I think there's ways to evade it, but I could definitely see how it would be frustrating. Like other BRs, there are loot caches laying around. Opening these will give you some cash, armor, weapons, and sometimes field upgrades or streaks. You'll find the most rare weapons in these crates rather than just lying about. The game is fun, fast paced in the right areas, and overall I really enjoy Warzone more than I did Blackout. But this mode is more than your typical soulless BR. Infinity Ward actually implemented some really cool features which I love as it shakes up the typical BR gameplay. One of these new additions is Contracts. They are optional objectives that if you choose to engage in will give you different rewards. There's Recon Missions, which essentially tells you to go capture a domination point, but be warned, when you start capping this objective, a flare will shoot up revealing the location of the point, so enemies with a keen eye will know there's a squad trying to take this location. Successfully secure this point and some goodies will drop for you as well as reveal the location of the next circle. Scavenger missions have you going from different locations and searching some crates. Some of these crates are in harder to reach spots and some are super easy. Searching all three of these crates will give you a pretty good reward from that final one. Then there's bounty missions. Pick these up and the general location of an enemy will be marked on the map. The circle they are in moves but not in real time. So, you kind of know their general location, but it's not extremely precise. Kill your target and you get some cash, but the target also knows that they're being hunted, and there's a threat indicator on their screen. This indicator is cut off into three sections. If the bar is green, their enemy isn't really that close. Yellow means that they're gaining on you, and red, which is a full bar, means that this fight is pretty much inevitable. If the target survives, they're no longer marked and they will get a cash reward for surviving being hunted. All of these missions are timed, so you're going to want to do them relatively quick. But there's no giant penalty for you if you don't actually finish these missions. You just don't get the rewards. These contract missions are located all around the map, so you'll have plenty to choose from and find. I love the implementation of contracts. These optional challenges give you something more to do than just go for kills. It's a welcome addition to the BR mode, and I'm glad to see Infinity Ward innovate. I mentioned money, so let's talk about that. You can find cash laying around in loot crates, or get it from contracts, or pick it up from the bodies of enemies you've killed. The money is used at buy stations. These are scattered around the map, much like the contracts. Utilizing a buy station will give you some options. You can purchase armor plates, field upgrades, kill streaks, which at the time is only a UAV, cluster strike, precision airstrike, and a shield turret, and much like multiplayer, you'll probably never see a shield turret. The streaks aren't super OP until the late game, where the circle is pretty tiny, so overall, I think they're fine. Personally, I'd like to see the game not allow streaks to be used within, let's say, the last two circles. I think that would be pretty balanced. Regardless. You can also buy back teammates who have died, a self-revive kit so if you're downed you can get yourself back up, and a loadout drop. A loadout drop being arguably the best thing you can buy. On launch, the loadout drop was really easy to get. Even now its price is higher, but I can obtain a loadout drop pretty quickly. Money is just pretty easy to come by in this mode. There definitely isn't a recession going on here. A loadout drop lets you select a loadout, go figure. 
these are where your creative classes come in. So you can have your own completely customized weapon, equipment, perks, and so on. The reason that this is so powerful isn't because of those weapons. Don't get me wrong, having a custom weapon is amazing, but being able to have perks is a game changer. On my classes, you'll always see me running ghosts, so UAVs are not a problem for me. These drops will also let you play the way you want. So you can have that sniper that handles and performs to your playstyle, and an SMG secondary or a shotgun. Loadout drops can be bought, or they'll just fall randomly throughout the match. You can only have three active perks at any given time, so only the perks from your most recent loadout drop is what you're going to end up keeping. Unless you die or get a new drop. Probably one of the most fun additions to the Battle Royale genre in Warzone is the Gulag. In some Battle Royales, if you die right away, then you either leave the game if you're a solo, or you just sit there and watch as your teammates continue on. But here, if you die, you get taken prisoner and get to fight for freedom against others who have perished. I absolutely love this addition. It gives you a chance to get back into the fight, so even if you die at the start of a match, you get to go to the Gulag. If you win, you come back to the game. If you lose, you gotta wait for your team to redeploy you, that's if you're not in solo. The Gulag is a 1v1 fight, with you and your opponent getting the same random gun. I do wish there was more weapon variety, because as it stands now, there's only pistols and shotguns. I think the more variety, the better, really. But there are a couple different variations of that Gulag 1v1 map, so it's not really going to be the same exact situation every time. You can also spectate the fights if you're in the Gulag waiting your turn. So if your teammate is in the same Gulag as you, then you can provide some useful callouts when they get into the fight. Prisoners can also throw rocks that make some noise and will distort players momentarily if they get hit. If for some reason nobody comes into the gulag within a minute or two, the game will automatically spawn you back into the game as if you won. Which is good as you don't just have to sit there the whole game if somehow nobody dies for a while. Towards the end of the game, the gulag will close, so you don't need to worry about that guy that you just killed in the final circle coming back from above. I think the gulag is very balanced and I can't really think of any major tweaks besides weapon variety to add to it. Overall, I absolutely love Warzone, and as a fan of Battle Royales, it's a welcome addition. The culmination of the base gameplay and these new features really solidifies it as a solid mode. Hopefully one that continues to be supported even after the normal life cycle of Modern Warfare. It's a Battle Royale. You win some, and you lose most of them. So camping is pretty much expected. Sometimes the audio is wonky, and you can't hear footsteps properly. Sometimes you're being sniped by someone camping on top of a building. Hell, even at long ranges, some buildings turn into Play-Doh, like PUBG. There's bullet drop on snipers, so at extreme range it at least takes some consideration. But I've yet to find out the limit on the ranges. There's things I've neglected to mention in the multiplayer section, like finishing moves that are available. Where a neat little animation will play if you get to drop on someone from behind, and if you hold the melee button, this will play. It's kind of like assassinations from Halo. They're fun to do, but also pretty risky. If you have a sidearm, you can also use that on ladders. So let's say there's a pesky sniper on the roof. If you have a pistol, you could potentially climb a ladder to the building, kill him, without having to step foot on the roof. Or let's say he's got a claymore, you wouldn't really set that off. It's the little things like that that add to some sense of realism that I love in games. For some reason, Infinity War doesn't have all those modes constantly though. So one week duels will be in the game, and then they'll take out quads or trios. Things like that is pretty annoying. Like, why not have all those squad amounts active? I mean, they've just released that they've had more than 60 million players at least try the game. So I find it hard to believe that there's not enough players. All in all, I think Warzone is a solid experience. It has its bugs, graphical issues, and some problems, but I think it's one of the more top tier Battle Royales. I would without a doubt recommend this mode. Black Ops 4 left a bad taste in people's mouth. A $60 game with a $50 season pass paid battle pass, loot boxes, direct buys in an in-game store, it was just not consumer friendly at all. And Activision did little to remedy that situation during the game's life cycle. But did they learn from their mistakes? 
Well, it's with great pleasure that I can say without a doubt that Modern Warfare's take on monetization is by far the most consumer-friendly model that we have ever seen in the Call of Duty franchise. The game is a regular price $60 experience, with a couple of different higher priced versions available at launch. Those higher priced options would just give you some cosmetic items. DLC content such as maps are available free for everyone on the same day. Xbox, PlayStation, PC all get the same updates on the same day. Nobody's left out. Sony does still have a deal with Activision, so PlayStation still does get some exclusive content. This being some weapon blueprints being exclusive for about a month. But blueprints aren't game changing, so it's really not a huge issue in my eyes. The only egregious thing about this is survival, being locked behind a one year exclusivity deal with Sony. But besides survival and some blueprints, all the platforms can enjoy the same content at the same time. And being that cross-platform is finally a thing, it only made sense to give everybody the same content. Nobody is alienated. There are direct buys from an in-game store, but all of these items are cosmetic. There's new operators, blueprints, emblems, and things like that. No game-changing variants are in the store. On top of that, there is a battle pass. 100 tiers and a free and paid progression path. The basic paid path costing about 10 US dollars. If you were to progress to tier 100, you'd get more than enough COD points to make back what you spent. And they tend to put out new weapons in the pass or in challenges. In the pass, new weapons are usually unlocked by about tier 30, meaning that you don't really need to grind a ton just to get a weapon. If you don't make it far enough in the past, do not worry, you can complete some challenges to unlock these weapons too afterward. These passes are broken up into seasons, lasting a couple months each. Each season brings with it some new content in maps, operators, and story. You can get some new emblem sprays and more in the battle pass. Yeah, I've kind of glossed over sprays and gestures because they're not really relevant. You can use sprays like in Overwatch or gestures, which are just hand motions. It's fine, I guess, but I never really use them unless I'm just messing around. They're there. Sprays are just there to kind of be filler, so it's kind of meh. But back to the seasons. Season 1 was kind of weak for the battle pass. Season 2 bringing in a new rendition of Ghost, and Season 3 seeing Alex return. I mentioned in the campaign section that Alex died, but I never really trust an off-screen death. And that sentiment has held true, as it was revealed in a cinematic for Season 3 that Alex survived the blast, somehow only losing a leg in the process. I loved Alex in the campaign, and I just wish his multiplayer model had that sweet stash. I mean, he still has a mustache, but it just doesn't look the same. But then again, that's in-game cinematics versus actual gameplay models. Regardless, the seasons do have storyline implications, with these different cinematics showing off different pieces of the story. It's nice for those who actually care, but it isn't of utmost importance, especially if you just want to shoot things. So all of this seems pretty positive, but what's the catch? Well, drip feed. Content is not all available at once. A new season comes out, and they release a couple of maps, and then you wait a little bit more for another map. It's not like the other CODs, where four maps would drop all at once. Drip feeding content is done to give constant updates to a game, and to give people a reason to come back. At launch, the drip feed model was a little bit annoying as it felt like it just took forever to get enough content into the game. But at this point, there's just so many new maps and updates that I don't really have a problem with the model. I like it more than getting one map pack and then waiting like three months for yet another map pack, especially now that this is all free. Each model has its pros and cons, but I personally don't hate this model but I do see where it does turn people off. It's really just a pick your poison scenario. Do you want four maps at once and then nothing for a few months, or do you want constant updates with new maps all the time? Overall, I'm happy with the monetization model, and post-launch content system in Modern Warfare are pretty good. It just sucks because COD is a yearly game. I just wish these releases were like two to three years apart so we could actually get some more time with these games but my voice really won't make them change that. I think the monetization in the game is best that we've had, and I'm perfectly content with what we got with this.
Modern Warfare, in my eyes, is a stellar entry into the series. The game delivered a short but impactful campaign, has the multiplayer that I know and love in this series, and a consumer-friendly monetization model. It's got a kick-ass battle royale, but Spec Ops is kinda meh. The game looks really good and sounds amazing too, and I just think it's one of the better CODs that we've gotten in a long time. I've seen people's fair criticisms, but some of it's just a bit ridiculous. Honestly, most of what I see on Twitter and Reddit is just kind of bitching and moaning. And now all of a sudden people are like, nah, Black Ops 4 was better. Like, are you insane? Black Ops 4 had no campaign, a couple of good zombie maps, the rest being remakes, a decent multiplayer, but the maps just kind of all felt the same to me, and a decent battle royale. Blackout was decent, I had fun with it, but I think Warzone is much better. Black Ops 4 monetization was also god-awful. The COD community is just so bipolar. Every year, their favorite dev changes. When it's a Treyarch game that's out, people are saying Infinity Ward is the best, and when an IW game is out, people are saying Treyarch's the best. And then Sledgehammer's just kinda there. But seriously, Modern Warfare does do a lot of things right. It has its flaws, less than perfect map design, some annoying features like mounting, and it launched some pretty major weapon balance issues. But I've sunk days into this game, and I've had a ton of fun with it along the way. Not every Call of Duty game has perfect maps or weapons. I just think the community likes to complain. I for one am usually pretty consistent with my views on the games of the series, so I doubt my opinion on this one will change. Modern Warfare 2019 is a solid game, one that I recommend. I guess we'll see what people's opinion on this game is in years to come. If you've made it this far, then thank you so much for watching. This video was my first attempt at a super long form review of a game. The amount of time I've spent on this video in its entirety is just insane. Being that this is my first attempt at this, I'm sure there's some aspects of the game that I forgot to talk about. They may be minor, but I'm sure there's things that after I upload this, I'll kick myself for not putting in. Regardless, thank you for watching. Links to my socials are down below, and if you want to see more of my opinions in life, that's where you'll find it. Like and subscribe if you liked its content and want to see some more videos like this. Thanks again, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Cheerio, mates.